Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Brockton Rotary. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans, white with foam. And I'm going to ask Joanne to come up and give our invocation, please. Good afternoon, Rotarians, and welcome guests. Great to see everybody today. We all go through times in our lives when we have moments that truly humble us. We've had a lot going on in this country lately. And the other day, I was sitting in Whole Foods looking at my $200 worth of groceries, and I was having a conversation on the phone about an event that I'll be hosting. And the woman I was speaking to said, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the people who are going to benefit from this event. And she told me a story about a mother, a single mother, and the struggles that she was going through and how this event will benefit her family. In the moment that she told me this, she told me that this mom had come into a service agency locally and asked for formula for her baby because she couldn't feed the baby. Now here I am sitting there looking at my $200 worth of groceries and my eyes just welled up and I thought, we all, especially in this room, people who are here to serve others in service above self, we all have so much to be grateful for. So I'm asking you today to just take a moment, close your eyes, and really consider all of the amazing blessings in your life, and that being a part of this group here today, Rot Rotarians, is also a blessing that you're creating the energy to help shift and change the world together. Thank you. Remind everybody, the Centennial Pins are here, and this is one of our biggest fundraisers. Chris Cooney uh, really uh, spent a lot of time on this. Um, Robin does have the pins here. A bunch of people did um, indicate that they were, wanted a pin, so if you haven't gotten one yet and you haven't paid for one yet, please see her. They're $100 each. Um, we have 100 of the pins. Uh, all the proceeds and the money collected for that goes to the C&E Fund. So if you haven't got one yet, the Centennial's coming up next month, um, please see Robin and get one. Um, invoices, they went out, so if you have any questions on invoices, please talk to Robin or Betty. Um, I want to thank, you know, it's funny, I look around this room and I want to thank the people, myself included, that attended the multicultural uh, networking event last week. And it's funny, when you go to one of these events and you look around, you see a lot of the people who are in this room actually attending the same event. Um, it was a very successful event, a lot of people there. I've actually, I think I asked about eight or nine people to be attending lunches within this month and next month and potential uh, members to join this club. So if you have a chance to attend one of these networking events, especially if it's within the local community, I would, you know, highly recommend it. Uh, Board of Directors meeting is next Tuesday, the 6th at 22 Benny at 5.30. Um, next week's speaker will be Alf, uh, next week's presenta presentation will be Al our own Alf Alfie O'Shea uh, for St. Patrick's Day. For those who cannot attend luncheons and want to attend the makeup breakfast meetings, they're March 15th and March 20th, uh, 7.30. Um, I would like to ask Richard if he would just stand up and give a quick minute on the spinathon that you wanted to, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, so we Uh, raising money uh, for the old Pawnee Y. 
go towards the next campaign. For those of us who have been involved in such membership, whatever we know, where those funds go and why, it, 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 it's it's a very dear to many of us. In fact, Joanne kind of opened up the door talking about what you said. Listen, you have to have more control. Uh, if those things happen out there. There's, there's, there's families, the children that uh, are in need, and, and it's up to us to do what we can. So again, uh, next Thursday, March 8th, all of our branches, and we have a screening on right on the branches. Uh, you can come in and choose to make a donation. That would be nice. 100% uh, does go to uh, the only one, and it's just something that uh, we're, we're proud to do. And, uh, like to okay. Thank you, Richard. So if you guys can make it, you want to donate, um, it's a great cause. Uh, see Richard. Um, wrapping it up, we have our biggest fundraiser coming up this month, the Pancake Breakfast. Uh, Heather has some forms. If you have not filled out a form uh, for a placemat or an ad, please see Heather. Uh, we're still looking for raffle items, donations. Um, I did get some stuff from the Bruins, which I will hand over to Bill. I'm still waiting to get some stuff from the Celtics also. Um, but if you have any questions concerning any of the raffle items, or if you have not placed an ad, uh, remember this is our biggest fundraiser of the year. Um, and we need you know, as many Rotarians to participate as possible. Last year was a fantastic event. It was better than the year before. So if you do have any questions, please see Heather. Uh, Bill's not here today. Happy Bucks. Anybody got any Happy Bucks today? I don't see. Richard Hook. I've got two here, and one is actually uh, a pin by uh, our dear uh, Mr. Lutz. So he was doing some work in my office and noticed that I didn't have my pin on it. You have all the time, Richard. Here we go. Now, the other one is Mr. Lutz, too. And this one is I need him to know that you are in, and that's great. But I need you to know that I sit on the committee there and refuse and renew your contract. That was good. All right. Can we waive his fine? <laughs> All in favor? <laughs> um, Amy, um, I, I, I'd like Amy, uh, while we're here, she could just give an update on our centennial event that's coming up next month, if you'd like to, Amy. Emmy Awards, and he wrote a piece of music describing the feeling of Rockston, and he wrote the music, and Vinnie Macrina's uh, concert band is going to perform it on April 4th at the Spring Concert, and uh, the music is beautiful, and we're going to have a visual display of pictures going on with the three parts, which is music of um, immigrants, music of champions and music of diversity. Those are the three movements of this piece. And there'll be beautiful pictures displayed at the same time that the music will be playing. And just yesterday I spoke with Arnie Danielson down at the Cultural Center in Brockton. And we're going to have a, uh, a, a meet and greet. Uh, the composer will be there and maybe play a little music. And I thought we would have all the sponsors come and maybe uh, Rotary will come and we'll have, they, they hold up to 100 people and we'll have uh, uh, cheese and wine and I'm trying to get Rocky Marciano Jr.'s uh, presence there. He seems very interested in coming and introducing the second movement, music, music of champions uh, at the concert. So maybe he'll come to the, um, the, the, the reception, we're calling it a reception the night before okay. on the 3rd. So, All right. I'll have an update for that. The reception will be at the uh, Stacy Adams uh, Cultural Center down on Dover Street. And uh, we'll be getting a little more on that since it was just 12 hours ago that I thought of it. So. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but it's, it's already in the making because Arnie works very quickly like I do. He already gave me the whole... Uh, lowdown on how we'll do it, and it sounds really great. He does a very classy job, and we'll have a fun evening before the concert. Okay, thank you, Heather. I appreciate that. That should be well attended by everybody. I'd like to ask Steve Green if he would come up and give us an introduction on today's fantastic speaker. See. Good afternoon, everybody. 
Well, if you're into sports, you, this man needs no introduction, really. I mean, I find him to be the greatest sports writer I've ever read in my life, and I'm not just saying it, but ever since I was a kid, I started reading The Globe, and uh, you know, one fascinating article after another after another, and then came the books, the one with Larry Bird. He's got a million of them. Uh, I seem to bump into him every year at the Final Four, and it's his fault I go there because I used to go to the NIT in New York until he told me one day, why don't you go to the uh, Final Four? I said, because I go to the NIT. He says, well, the Final Four is so much better. It's the greatest day in sports. And I go, what do you mean? And he goes, well, on Saturday, you get two games for the price of one. How, how great, you know. And he's right. And I've been going ever since 1975 when he told me, and if health uh, holds true, I've been there, I think I've missed like five since 1975. So thanks a lot, Bob. And the price of the tickets went up, but just, you know. <laughs> Uh, let's see. What were the chances back in the old days of the Boston Garden with 13,909 fans that Elaine and Bob Ryan would get stuck sitting next to Carol and Steve Green? I mean, that's pretty cool, huh? You sit down one day and one of your idols is sitting right next to you. If I had a second life, I've already, I told Bob a long, long time ago, I don't know if you remember, I'd love to be a sports writer. I thought it was a great job, but he, he might have second thoughts on that. Uh, and, and maybe now if you uh, listen to his podcast, which he's into, uh, which uh, are great, by the way. I've, I've listened to like four with uh, Larry Bird, Bob Cousy, Pete Gammons. They're very good and uh, informative. And so, uh, without further ado, I'd like to bring up what I consider the best sports writer that's ever lived. We should all be out there, by the way, today. And then let's play two day. Tomorrow's not going to be very good. Uh, Steve's right. Uh, Elaine and Bob Ryan in 1978 uh, became custodians of. Uh, seats at section 62, row A, seats 1 and 2, looking down on the foul line and at the Celtics bench, and sitting in seats 3 and 4, where Steve Green and Carol. So uh, that uh, is a gospel truth that we've known each other that long. And um, I'm, I'm glad I was able to introduce them to the, to the, the fun of the then CAA. Uh, can't, has it really been 40 years, do you think? Oh, I, I know it's a long time, but wow. Well, nice to be back anyway. And I just want to share a couple of thoughts with you before the, which was usually the good part, which is the, the questions and the arguments and the debates and, and the why did you say this and why didn't you say that? So we won't worry about that. But, um, you know, we, you hear often about uh, how lucky we are in, to be in Boston at this particular point in time with regard to the proliferation of championships as opposed to being, well, almost anywhere else. It's all true. Uh, and, and I did a little research just to, uh, uh, ex so I can share with you exactly how lucky uh, that we have been, and, and we are truly in the golden age of sports here in, in Boston since the turn of the century, since the, in the 21st century. Now, uh, I'm not going to get into that debate as about whether it started in 2000 or 2001. For the sake of this argument, I'm going to say it started in 2000, all right? And we can have, <laughs> I'm not going to nitpick on that one. Uh, since 2000, uh, among all, well, first of all, uh, um, 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 this is among all the cities that uh, that have uh, all four major sports, uh, and I'm, I'm excluding the MLS. I hope I'm not offending anybody, but you know the four leagues I mean. Uh, so there are a number of cities that have all four major sports, uh, and of course, if you don't, then you're not even in this, in, in this discussion at all. Um, the uh, uh, Boston has had ten championships, as you well know, ten championships, uh, uh, and we've come achingly close to some others, uh, not just the Patriots uh, on th three different occasions, losing uh, excruciating games, uh, but of course the Celtics lost very painfully to me in, in 2010, should have won that one, and could have uh, won in 2009 also, but uh, shoulda, coulda, woulda, you know, we all know that stuff. We've got ten, and we are the only city in America with a championship in each of the four major sports since 2000, since the turn of this century. Uh, second is LA. They've got seven. However, there's an asterisk. This is assuming that you count Anaheim as LA. Now, I don't know how many people here are thoroughly familiar with the Southern California circumstance, but uh, uh, Orange County is not LA. I'm sorry. Uh, but they, uh, like, and, and they desperately, uh, the ownership of the uh, Angels desperately want to be considered an LA team, hence they're now known but about their fourth different name since they first came into being as the California Angels back in 1961. Uh, they're now the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. Oh, brother, you know, L-A-A. -A. No, well, LA's got seven. 
and in two different sports, uh, baseball with the, uh, with Anaheim. Remember, the Angels won it in 0-2, two, two, in case you forgot. And, um, of course, the Lakers. And uh, also the L.A. Kings. L.A. Kings have won two when you weren't looking. Okay. Uh, next, checking in with five or two cities. Pittsburgh, which has done it in two sports, in uh, uh, hockey and football. And San Francisco slash Oakland, the Bay Area. I will graduate. They are one. Yeah, let's be. If you know that geography, that's 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 not arguable. They're one, and they've they've got five in, in uh, also in two sports, uh, which are baseball and basketball. The 49ers, I know you think about them, but it was all in the 21st 20th century. They haven't won in the 21st century yet, and they're not in about to win anytime soon. Garoppolo or no Garoppolo, okay. Um, Oh, I got New York. New York has six. Now, New York, we have to start with this. You know how many teams there are in New York uh, that they can claim as their own? Nine. They've got nine. They've got two in each of the, in, in baseball, basketball, and, and football, and they've got three hockey teams. Uh, so uh, they've got nine to choose from. They've got six. Uh, they've got six uh, in, in three different sports. The only sport that they haven't done it is basketball. The last Nick championship was 1973. And they aren't remotely close, as anyone knows who follows the NBA right now. Okay, uh, Chicago, they've got five in in two different sports: baseball and hockey. Uh, and they've got each of their baseball teams having one, which is which is good for them, nice for them. Uh, Detroit has three uh, in two different sports, which are uh, hockey, and they did win it no four in base basketball. People forget that, but they won it no four. Philadelphia has two in uh, one each for the Phillies in 08 and the uh, Eagles. <laughs> The Eagles. Um, Miami has two because the, they have uh, the Florida Marlins won it in 03 and, and the uh, Miami, excuse me, they have three because the, um, I forgot, two sports. They have three because the Heat won it twice. And then with one each, Dallas, uh, who got it in, um, um, I'm thinking already, in basketball, in 2011, the Mavericks won. And Phoenix, the Arizona Cardinals in 01, beating the Yankees. Well, we give them a hand for that, by the way, don't we? So we do that. Okay. Shut out uh, among the cities that have four uh, franchises, Minneapolis. Uh, they've been shut out in the, in, the, in the decade. All right, I'm just making a point that that's how lucky we are. And, and of course, no team, uh, no, no city has as many. No city, we're the only one with four. The only one other city has won in, in three different sports. That's New York with their nine teams, you know, big deal. And you, if you look at the standings of all these leagues right now, you say, when's the next city that's going to do this? Well, of course, with three of them, and it would be New York, and they're going to need it in basketball. Ha, 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 ha. It's not happening anytime soon. So I, and then there's nobody else with, with, uh, Three, believe it or not, uh, Detroit. Excuse me, Detroit. And we know that the uh, uh, the, the, the Tigers aren't close. Uh, they had their shot. They had a real good chance a couple times. They didn't do it. And uh, they're 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 re rebuilding uh, slash tanking right now. And uh, they're in that mode. Uh, and of course, the Lions. Uh, <clears throat> the Lions uh, have have they have won one playoff game since 1957. Uh, so those of you Tobin Road fans should now take a bow because that's and uh, you know that and Bob Hunchy Hunchmeyer those who were playing for the, the, the Detroit Lions when they last won. So we stand apart. We're lucky. I mean, uh, I wish we could all take credit for it, but unfortunately, these people who put the teams together have to get all the credit. But we are lucky. So I just want to put that in perspective. That. Um, and when you hear this, it's not an exaggeration. Uh, we are very fortunate. And look at the year we're having. I mean, all right, the Patriots, we know it didn't get, get it done, but you can't be uh, uh, crying when you go to the Super Bowl, uh, which a lot of cities, have, some cities have never done, uh, namely Detroit, and a few others have now, never done it since the, Super, since the merger, which was effective in 1970. Uh, um, the NFL merger uh, took place then. I mean, it took place in 66, but they didn't implement it until 70. So. Uh, the, the, you know, it's 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 just an amazing. Uh, uh, look where we are right now. The, the, the um, Patriots came close. Celtics, as we know, are having a good year. I'm not predicting a championship. I don't think they would beat uh, Golden State or Houston if they can get out of the East. But they're good and fun and exciting and worthwhile. The Bruins, quite surprisingly, uh, are, are, are a, I think a legitimate contender. I think this Rick Nash trade gave them a shot. And they've bolstered up their defense. And uh, now the, I just uh, worry about this uh, Petit Bergeron injury at the time that it comes because they're jockeying for position with, with Tampa Bay and Pittsburgh in the East and, and Toronto, excuse me, and, and uh, you know, not having Bergeron for a, quite an indeterminate period of time. If he's not going to be evaluated for two weeks, God knows how long it is before he plays. <laughs> of course, we just hope he's back for the playoffs. But they're good. And of course, the Red Sox, uh, who um, now got the big bat. God, oh, didn't you get tired of hearing about waiting for the big bat? You know, really. Uh, but I did. 
and I said, hey, the team's not that bad anyway. I'll live with it, but I'm actually it's much nicer to live with the team or to root for the team now that they've got J.D. Martinez. I still don't think, you know, look at it this way. They don't have a lineup that can compete with the Yankees for thunder, for power, but it's a deeper lineup. The, uh, right now, I think it's deeper. I don't. I, look, think of it this way. Look at it this way. Um, uh, who's the worst hitter in the in the prospective starting lineup? Probably it's either Jackie Bradley Jr. or Christian Vasquez. And Jackie Bradley Jr. hit 30, uh, 26 home runs two years ago. And if he comes back, even splits the difference between what he did in 16 and what he did in 17, that's a pretty productive uh, player. And we know his glove is is phenomenal. I've, I've been here since 1964. I can't vouch for Jimmy Pearsall, but I can vouch for every other center fielder they've had since then. And, and he is, and without any question in my mind, the best defensive center fielder that we've had around here. And there were some pretty damn good ones. And I'm going to hear all the arguments for Freddie Lynn and for a few others, but I'm telling you right now, Jackie Bradley Jr. is the best defensive center fielder uh, that they've had in this period of time. And, and I also, I can't vouch for Tris Speaker. I'm sorry. He, he, he retired in 1927, so I, I, I just, just missed him. So, you know, just before that last appearance here, you know, at the, the Rotary. So the Red Sox are in good shape. And think about this pitching staff, if. Oh, everybody wants to talk if, because this is the time of the year to talk if. If, 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 if all goes well. Look at the rotation they could have. They have two Cy Young winners, one of whom is coming off a terrible year, Procello, and you know he's going to uh, uh, bounce back to some reasonable degree. And the best pitcher on the staff is a guy who never won it, has yet to win a Cy Young, and that's Chris Sale. Six times he's, he's, he's been in the top three, I think. But uh, so they, there's, if they can be lucky, stay healthy, uh, same with everybody, of course. But the, the potential right now, sitting here on March 1st, is, is very exciting. And I'm excited about the team. So uh, there's nothing not to like uh, in, in the Boston sports scene, quite frankly, uh, and on the pro teams. Now, I just want to take a few minutes to just discuss uh, uh, and put, give you a little food for thought before we uh, entertain some questions. And that is I'm here uh, as, as my guys, obviously, as a sports writer and a sports uh, commentator. I'm still very fortunately uh, doing stuff on ESPN for Around the Horn. And, and um, I'm very happy that I've been very grateful to have done that. Work with them. Uh, it's made my whole life in sports. I'll just read a very quick background. My father was involved in sports in uh, various administrative capacities, uh, public relations, marketing, uh, uh, communications, however you want to frame it, in both uh, professional sports and in college sports. When, he was, when I was six, he became the athletic director at Villanova. Not, not the assistant, excuse me. But he had a lot of power, and he was in the promotion there. And uh, uh, that's when I got introduced into college sports. So I've been following the NCAA basketball world since 1952, believe me, literally. Um, the, uh, uh, though I don't ever remember, and this is not hyperbole, I do not, my memory, and most of our memories start around three and four. I, I, I think I can date mine from age four. Do not remember a time when we weren't at a game, going to a game, or coming from a game, or getting ready to go to a game. I mean, the games were my life. So I got this very staunch uh, sports background. It's just a sports DNA, if you will. Well, but sports writing is a two-part word. And the first part is the easy part. You know, I just absorbed the sports. I loved the sports, played sports, read about sports. But that's a, the key. The second part is the, uh, the extra layer for me, which is I happen to be a kid who liked to read. And uh, I love reading, and I leave, love reading uh, about sports uh, uh, biographies and team biographies and all. And, and I was a kind of a precocious kid in, uh, at, at St. Joseph's School in Trenton, New Jersey, and was probably the only eight-year-old who knew what the infield fly rule was, you know? So I could be a little obnoxious at times in, in that regard. But, I, uh, but that DNA is in there, too. So on the one side, I got the sports DNA, and the other side, I got the reading DNA, and I, you put them together, and you wind up with a sports writer. That's pretty much the story. But one, something occurred to me, um, uh, I don't know, not too, too long ago, really. And that is, why are we sports fans? What is it all about? What is it? I'm, I'm not going to assume that everybody here is a staunch sports fan, but I bet the majority of you are pretty good sports fans. And, and I bet you've never, you just, you just take it for granted. You know, you like it. You know you like it. You like a certain sport. You like a certain player. You like a certain team. You like going to your games. You like, but why? What is it? And I try to give it a little thought. Now, I'm, I'm run this by you. See if I'm right. Let's see if you think I'm crazy or whatever. I have identified, arbitrarily, of course, it's, I mean, I'm setting the rules here, that there are basically six categories of what I call leisure forms of entertainment that people who are fortunate enough to have leisure form of ent entertainment in their life, uh, when they're not working, you know, three jobs to support a family or anything and don't have time to screw around doing nothing or, or, or enjoying themselves. But that would probably account for most of us in this room, that we, we have leisure activity. Uh, six different ways that we generally amuse ourselves 
over and above, I'm not talking about hobbies, I'm not talking about stamp collecting, I'm not talking about gardening, I'm not talking about physical exertion, frankly, at all. I'm not, so forget about golf or, or, or uh, you know, working out or anything, that, that's a different category. But I'm talking about, I think you'll agree with me when I give you the six things under, under the, this umbrella of entertaining ourselves, okay? First is books, self-evident books. Uh, I'm a big book reader and I can't imagine ever not being, not reading a book. All right, that's, that's completely self-evident. Second one would be art. Now, I'm not gonna stand here and present myself as some art expert or some uh, raging intellectual about it. Uh, I know what I like, and what I like is Impressionism. That's the one that, and so if there's a nice Ro Mo Renoir or Monet uh, around, uh, I like to go, I like, the, the, that's what I like, and, and I can enjoy other things too, but you know, museum going, all right? I'm going to my share of museums, both here and in Europe, and 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 uh, and I consider myself reasonably, you know, uh, cultured in that regard. But I'm no expert. But I like it. It's nice. It's a part of. So it's it's I'd say a, a lesser part, a minor part of my life. Third one would be theater. And same thing, I, uh, we we're subscribers at, uh, to the Huntington. We've been there for years. So I go to lots of stuff. A lot of times, usually I'm walking in and said. What's the, what is it, what is it, what's it all about? I don't even have to know, we're subscribers to this. Obviously Broadway goes, speaks for itself. I, I have very fond memories of a lot of great nights on Broadway, etc. but the theater speaks for itself. Fourth one is common to everybody, that's movies, film, cinema, and I'm excited about the Oscars. I still care about the Oscars, uh, uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to Sunday night uh, very much. Uh, but we can, that speaks for itself, we all enjoy movies, okay. Fifth one, is uh, the one that has a kinship, I think, for a lot of us with sport, and that's music. Uh, whatever, almost everybody here has some kind of form of music that they like. We've all been to some kind of performance of somebody. I don't have to over, uh, but, but what the thing about music, and the difference between that, and I'm gonna to get to now, with the sixth one, and the only one where so oftentimes people are forced to be on a defensive about uh, their uh, apologizing because they're interested, and that of course is sports. Uh, uh, if some people still look down on sport, don't understand why we waste our time involved, involved in sport. Well, I'm gonna to try to explain that a little bit. Uh, each of these things in some way, shape, or form stimulate us. It, it, it pushes some kind of internal button that, that gives us some pleasure and enjoyment to some degree. Uh, all right, and, and uh, the one about sport, that, that, and, and here's what I, I, I take issue with, uh, a very common uh, premise that you hear. You'll often hear people say, and this has become really prevalent in the last 20, 25 years, well, sport, it's just a form of entertainment. It's just entertainment. No, no, no. Sport, capital S, entertainment, capital E, very different sensations, very different uh, uh, roles in your life, okay? Entertainment, for the most part, is scripted. And even when you go to a music or a concert, you don't go to a concert to be surprised for the most part, unless you're some musical expert or you know, or some dead, you know, real aficionado. You go to have your to hear what you like to hear. You want that performer to perform the song the way you heard it on the record. You don't want them messing around with the song. You don't want big surprises. You want a, you want a validation for the most part. I mean, I, I think that's a safe statement. Uh, it's you're not there for surprises. You're there for validation. But the great thing about sports that that makes it different, you don't know. You don't know, and, and, and uh, it's about competition, number one, if you enjoy just watching people compete at a high level for whatever and whatever it is. And number two, it's the uncertainty that, that provides, it creates a buzz, it creates, it creates a, a sensation, it creates a, a curiosity and, a, and a, an excitement. You feel alive, you, know, you just do in a way that these other things, quite frankly, is, uh, don't, uh, don't do. And plus it provides a commonality of, of, of things uh, for you to share with your, with your friends. I mean, as much as I, I People might enjoy having gone to a, a Monet exhibit at the Met I mean, or at the MFA uh, in Boston. Nobody's standing around talking about it with, at the water cooler support the next day. The way they, you know, it, that doesn't happen. But sports, that's what happens. And there's no greater. Well, we just came out of the. Um, and, and you don't have to even know a lot to appreciate it. We just came out of the Olympics. I don't know how many people were interested, but I was interested, and one reason being that I was fortunate enough to cover and go to 11 Olympics, six summer and five winter, and I really miss doing that. It's one thing I retired officially in 2012, full time from the Globe, and uh, I really miss going to the Olympics. And, and I, uh, I, I, I've been to Winter Olympics enough to uh, understand uh, certain things and, 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 and have a feel for it, but even if I don't understand the nuances of all these uh, uh, somewhat what, esoteric sports, uh, I'm not gonna portray myself as a biathlon expert uh, at all, but uh, uh, I, you, you know about the competition. If you know a little bit about the rivalries and the history, it, it creates something. So that when I was watching uh, our, our two uh, cross-country skiers, Kick and Randall and, and Jesse Diggins, in that uh, team pursuit thing uh, and uh, team relay thing, and, and here comes uh, Jesse Diggins uh, trying to outskate in the last lap these two uh, 
from, well, I think Norway and Sweden, which are the great uh, sports, uh, uh, winter sports capitals. Um, it was exciting. It was, and, and you know the stakes that if she wins, that means that her partner, Kick and Randall, who's 35 years old in her fifth Olympics, uh, is now a mother uh, and has been through an awful lot and, and, and knocked on the door uh, for all these years, is going to get a medal, a gold medal. And she got it. And, and that, that, that was exciting, I just think. And if you're a sports fan, you can relate to that. And how about the curling thing? I mean, just, you know, not that any of us are, maybe someone is a curling expert here, but probably aren't. And uh, we have a curler here? All right, we, we have a, we all have a quasi. All right, but I didn't know the total backstory until the, uh, play, until the Olympics were underway. Namely, that I knew we had finished last in Sochi, but I didn't know that uh, about the John Schuster and the rejects and puts this team together and he's, and, and he's been mocked in the social media and all this. <laughs> and we start off two and four in the, in the group competition and we wound up winning the gold medal. We beat uh, number one ranked Canada in the semis and, we, and, and, and then we beat number, uh, excuse me, number two rank, yeah, one, two rank, yeah, one rank Canada, two rank Sweden, or the other way around. We beat Canada and Sweden, and it's a huge upset. I, I mean, and you, it's exciting, okay. But no, I'll, I think the best example I'll give you is to what the, the sensation that, that is created and why we're sports fans, even if you never thought about it. Let's go back to Super Bowl 49. Let's go back to Super Bowl 49. All right, we're in the University of Phoenix Stadium, and um, a pass has just been completed from Russell Wilson to Curse on the six yard line. He's laying on his back, he's caught the ball, he's first and goal on the six, and what do we all know? What do we all not think? What do we all know at that moment? We're gonna lose. It's over. There's no, we're, it's over, they're gonna lose. The camera cuts to Brady, and it did. It cuts to Brady on the sideline, and he's sitting there with a look on his face of horror, and he's thinking, first of all, oh my God, it's happening again. That is, if there is a God, because I used to think there is one, but now I'm no longer sure, you know. Be, but six, seven years ago in this same building, David Tyree made the miracle catch. Yes, I see eyes rolling already. Well, I'm, and our eyes will roll forever. It's the last catch he ever made, you know, period. You know, uh, David Tyree, period. David Tyree catches the ball, and that sets up the winning touchdown. Uh, all right, for Burris. All right, so in the same building. So Brady's thinking about this, you know that. Now here comes first down, and Marshawn Lynch gets down to the one yard line. Thank you very much, Mayo and Chung, for keeping him out of the end zone. All right, so now it's second goal, and we, and we know we're losing. It's over. We're going to lose. Now, think about this. Who's the coach of the Seattle Seahawks? Thank you. What team did he coach before he coached? Uh, yes, once upon a time. And who succeeded him as coach of the New England Patriots? That's right, Bill Belichick. So now, you, fa you, know, you know, if you're a sports fan, you're a football, you're not sitting there identifying all this uh, specifically, articulately, but you know this, you're intuiting this. You know the stakes, you know the history, you know the irony, you know, you know all this. This is part of being a sports fan. And that's factoring into this whole thing. They're gonna lose to Pete Carroll. Uh, Bel you know, it's, it's, it's gonna be one-upsmanship one on Belichick. Uh, it, it's just this doom and gloom, you're in despair. And now they break the huddle and, whew, He's going to pass? And then, who's Malcolm Butler? <laughs> that was my reaction because I did not know of Malcolm Butler's existence on this earth until that moment. I, I did not know who he was. I had, I had no attention, did not know. And Malcolm Butler makes the, the great play, the smartest play, the, 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 you know, he makes the play that saves, saves their life. And, you know, and so that, now, that, you know how you felt. I mean, we're all in, and, and I doubt if anybody was watching it alone. I always say the definition of a loser is someone watches the Super Bowl alone. And uh, that might be unfair, but I think it's reasonably accurate. And we all watch it. In the, I was in my living room with friends. We have a group of people to get together to watch games all the time. And, you know, I mean, the euphoria, you know, you know how it's, I mean, it's changed your life now, but it enhances it. It enhances it. And if you are not a sports fan, you do not have that sensation ever. Ever. Not, you have other ones, but I'm telling you, no book, no painting, no theater act of play, no movie, and no concert gives you what that gives you. Period. And if you don't know this, I feel sorry for you. I mean it. And I feel sorry for anybody that can't relate to the other five things, too. I'm not, but, I mean, I'm not even saying that, one, that, that you have every right to be, feel the same way about the theater as I feel about sport. But I'm telling you... It's something that is not replaceable with these other forms of leisure entertainment. That's why you're a sports fan, even if you never thought about it. So 
and it's my great privilege over 40, well, it's up to 49 years, and I'm still writing, so uh, for the Globe on, on Sundays, uh, two or three Sundays a month, and, uh, you know, to be, and still commentating, and, uh, and now I have my podcast, as Steve told you, in fact, I have two podcasts, uh, one called Sports Reporters, which you can uh, dial up tomorrow morning, as well as the Bob Ryan Boston podcast, free, free plug here, tomorrow morning, but the point is, I'm still involved in the coverage of it, I'm very privileged to have done it, uh, I was kind of fated to do it, I think, as I pointed out earlier, and um, I'm a very lucky person to do that. But uh, I just so I'm just want to you walk away. I want you to walk away feeling proud of yourself for being a sports fan. And and there's nothing to ever to have to apologize for, even though there are people out there who would make who would try to shame you into not being a sports fan. Well, sorry, but they're missing something that we know and they don't know, and the hell with them. <laughs> That I open myself up uh, to uh, you know in any any questions about any anything and, and everything. Yes. It sounds like the best story that you ever had written then is with the Patriots. But how about when the Red Sox? Oh. Uh, won their first game, their first World Series. Oh, absolutely! I, I can tell you that's a very good uh, question, and people ask. Yeah. Okay. All right. First question had to do with uh, <laughs> reacting to 04. Um, after game three, which, in which they lost 19 to 8 on that Saturday night, uh, obviously I wrote a, a, a column that was the only sensible thing to write, I think, which was, okay, folks, everybody, you, I remember at the time, we want the Yankees. Well, you got the Yankees. You happy now? You know? And so no team had ever come from 03 in baseball, and no team at that point had ever come from 03 in basketball, and they still haven't, and only two had ever come from high. It was, nobody had done it in baseball. So we know they're going to lose. They're going to they're get beat by the Yankees. All right, so now we get to the 11 nights later, they're sipping the champagne. 11 nights later, they have gone 7-0 since that moment, and they, 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 they are winning the World Series. Um, it was... It was a joy to write about, obviously, and and of course, game four was uh, five. Excuse me, four was the the famous uh, Dave Roberts steal game, uh, but it starts off when Kevin Millar works a walk, and then Dave Roberts uh, steals the base on on uh, Mariona Rivera. Very close call at second, but he was safe. But thank God Joe West didn't go for Jeter's swipe tag, at which he was very good, very clever maneuver that made, mask look, made it look like he was tagging you, but he didn't. But and then, and then Bill Miller hits the single up the middle, and I don't you know this, ever see the video, but uh, Rivera tried to kick it. He, 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 he tried to kick it. It was, came right up of his foot. But anyway, and then, of course, they, they go 14 innings, and Poppy hits the uh, home run, uh, 12 innings. So Poppy hits the home run off Paul Quantrill. And then the next night, uh, they win in, in extra innings, and a uh, 10-pitch out bat by Poppy off of Edwin Loiza, and he bloops one to center to win. And, and the highlight of that game for me was Wakefield comes in in relief. Of course, he had been the GOAT. Not the GOAT, unfortunately, but he gave up the home run to Aaron Boone the year before and, um, uh, and, and losing game seven. And now he's in there in this important game, and Varitek's catching him, and he wasn't his usual catcher. As you know, it was Mirabelli. And Varitek has just two pass balls to get him from first to second and second to third, and now we're waiting for the third pass ball, and you know, here comes the winning run. But he strikes out. Uh, who was it? I forget, but he strikes out. Uh, and I'll get it, the DH. And... Uh, <coughs> They, uh, oh, oh, uh, flashing in my head. Anyway, gets out of that inning and they win the game. Okay, those two games together took over five, 11 hours of baseball. And they both ended on the same calendar day because game four ended after midnight and game five started at 5 p.m. Anyway, so from that point on, it was anticlimactic, really. Uh, they, the game six was the bloody sock game. And game seven, um, Johnny Damon hits a grand slam in second inning and they, they, they route. The Yankees had no pitching left. They, they mismanaged that series completely. And, and, uh, they, and, it, that was, and then what, the Cardinals... The first game was 11-9, uh, and nine. that's when Bellhorn hit the foul pole with the home run. From that point on, none of the games were in doubt when and they, and they win. That was, it was tremendous. I mean, it broke the so-called curse. Not that there ever was a curse, as you know, but it was, uh, it was the mythology, and it was fine. I mean, and, and so that, yeah, that was very exciting. Now, uh, this hot potato known as changing uh, Yawkey Way to Jersey Street, uh, my personal opinion, Mr. Henry, who still signs my paychecks, I guess I'd have to say, uh, ultimately for the Globe, uh, I wish he hadn't done it. I'm not, uh, I, I think it's going to be uh, um, uh, uh, just uncomfortable and messy people. There's a biography apparently coming out of Tom Yawkey. <laughs> 
uh, or is it out already? I think it's coming, in which it's going to basically try to defend his legacy. And uh, yes, uh, they were the last team to uh, uh, have a, a black player in 1959. Uh, but no, uh, he was not the guy who yelled, get those N-words off the field in 1945 in an infamous tryout for Jackie Robinson and two other guys. He wasn't even in Boston at the time. This has got to be completely debunked. And, and don't buy any, anybody that tells you he was. He wasn't from everything we know. Uh, his personal uh, relationships in South Carolina, uh, he's defended by a lot of people. Uh, uh, people of both, color, both colors uh, are sticking up for him and the way he handled uh, his affairs and his, and his personal life in, in South Carolina. I don't know. I mean, I, 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 and, and the Yorkie Foundation has done a lot of great things and, and wonderful things, and, and no one can deny that. It's, it's, it's going to be complicated to uh, balance this all off. So I, I just, I, it's, it's a really, it's a tough one. It's a very, very tough one. And, and, but all right, he's, he's in it. He's done it. He's made his case for it. And Mayor Walsh apparently is behind it. And, I, and you know, they got the approval of the butters that they needed. It sounds to me as if it's going to happen unless he changes his mind. Uh, you know, so I, I hope it works out for everybody concerned. Uh, uh, I know. But the, there's a lot, of a lot of history has to be reexamined. Re the one thing that I will criticize Tom Yawkey for, for sure, uh, is that he did have himself associated with known racists. Uh, Pinky Higgins uh, was a, not a good man, uh, a player and manager and general manager of the Red Sox, um, and he was a uh, old world, old line, classic uh, s southerner, uh, the type that you know we, we, we abhor. And unfortunately, he was very close to Yawkey and there may be a few others too. Uh, so he did not disassociate himself with those people, and you can always hold that against him. Yes. What's your favorite sport to cover, and what would you say were the best years of covering that sport? Well, and, and uh, that's a loaded question for me, which is uh, uh, there's a difference between my favorite sport to cover and my favorite sports. Favorite sport to cover, nothing was close, was golf. And the reason is it's the only sport TV can't screw up. <laughs> <laughs> Has to be played in the daylight. I am speaking from the perspective of a sports writer. Worrying about deadlines, thinking about how to write his or her story, you know, the, the way you'd like to write it, rather than under inordinate deadline pressure that restricts your creativity and, and messes you up, which every other sport now does, because with the exception of very few things, Super Bowl being one, at least that starts at 625 Eastern, uh, and the, the Final Four being the worst, because that starts at 922 Eastern, the championship game. Um, you know, golf is in the daylight. And the worst thing that can do to you at a golf tournament is start the final round on Sunday at the Masters or the Open at 3 Eastern rather than 2. That's the worst they can do to you. It's got to be done in the daylight, thank God. Now, I, it wouldn't matter if I didn't like golf, but I do like golf, and I do like covering golf, and I enjoyed it immensely. And it was one of the uh, things I really I came to enjoy a lot. So, okay, now, my two favorite sports are baseball and basketball in some order. It's like 51-49, depending on the season. You know, my, my reputation was built on basketball that was circumstantial because I was handed the Celtics at age 23 to cover. And, but had, had they handed me the Red Sox, it, it, I would have been equally happy. It was a better career deal for me by far to have been given the basketball for the simple reason that Boston has a hundred and literally now 120, 30, 40 year history of having excellent, well-known, established baseball writing. Did not have a history of having a, a, a established, you know, basketball writing. And I was able to get a niche and, and create an interest in, you know, and take advantage of a team that was on the rise from the second year that I started covering. My second year, my first year was the first year after Bill Russell retired and Sam Jones. They won 34 games. They actually beat the Knicks in the season series. I don't know if Steve knows that, but they did. The Knicks won the championship that year. But, but that was a veteran team. And the kids were uh, minimally, you know, involved. There were, it was White and Cheney. The next year, Cowens came. That that turned that began the turnaround that led to winning 68 games in 1973, 72, 73, and winning the championships in 74 and 76, and going to the final the conference finals in 75. So that was a wave that I rode. But I still love baseball. Uh, I always loved baseball. I got to cover the team finally in 1977, one full year. But then Peter Gammons came back from Sports Illustrated and took his beat back, which he should have, because he's the best, as good a baseball writer as we've ever known. And uh, by the way, we started at the Globe the same day uh, as an internship, June 50th anniversary coming up, June 10th, and uh, that was kind of cool. But uh, but I, I know I surprise people when I say, but my favorite sport to cover, you know, from that sense was golf. But I obviously my favorite events. 
And fa final four, Steve's right. I, I, uh, I, I used to get this question a lot, what's your favorite event or thing? And I, I used to say the final four. And it was, I liked it better when it was an afternoon doubleheader on Saturday rather than an evening doubleheader for the reasons I just discussed. They messed up the final four. But uh, uh, I still enjoy the competition. Yes, Eric. Uh, so here's a fun one for you, easy softball question. Uh, you got to pick eight Celtics uh, to go in a seven-game series for the championship of the oh world. Oh, boy, that's uh, – All well, time, all time. Eight, see the problem. Oh, boy, all right, well, I'm just thinking about overlap. You know, we've got three great centers. Do I take three roster spots up, you know, out of eight? With, with, with Russell Cowens and Parrish. Uh, I mean, just think about the, the, the problems here. Uh, you, you, know, you know your forwards are easy. Uh, you know, Bird, uh, Havlicek, and, and of course Havlicek actually, I, I take him as a six, as a combination player. So uh, he's on the side. So look, on all, all right, let's start with this. There are th three unarguable ones. One you have to explain to people because of the historical context. Russell, Bird, and Havlicek are unarguable, all right? Kuzi, Look, the game has changed. He's a, you know, the world has changed. But what he meant to the Celtics historically and the league and America sport is, is also unarguable. He was, he, his title was Mr. Basketball. He's the only person in the 20th century that, that had that official nickname. So, you, you know, do I put Kuzi in? Do I think that, that he could guard, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, Kyrie Irving? Uh, no, I, don't, I doubt very much he could. He, was, he wasn't noted for that. Uh, and so... That's a hard one. To, I have to nitpick this whole thing. But those three guys are unarguable. Uh, and, and, and so I'm, let me, I'll put Kuzi in there four. And, and, and Mikhail's in there five. I mean, the starting five, Russell, Bird, and, and Mikhail would be my, would my forwards, I'm, only because I'm going to bring John off the bench just strategically, all right? Uh, then I've got, I've got Kuzi and, and my, my big guard. Uh, now people can say, where's Pierce? Well, I love Sam Jones. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I think Sam Jones is the most underrated great Celtic and maybe an underrated great player of all time. And the, the, if he comes along today, he's not patiently sitting behind uh, you know, waiting for Charmin to, to, to leave, uh, as he did for four years, because, you know, that doesn't work anymore. He's, he's out of here. But he did, and his, his overall career numbers would be fantastic. But once he got the start, oh, in second year he started, he scored 25 a game, and he became one of the great clutch shooters of all time. Um, I, I, I would happily, I'd stack him up with Pierce, historically. Um, so there's a couple more names in there. I got Cowan's. How can I leave him out of my eight? He's got to be in there. I mean, he could play center and forward. How about you could play forward and guard? Mikhail could play guard and forward and center. Uh, how many names have I got? So, I mean, I can go on and on on that. But, and, and Pierce would have to be in that eight. He'd have to be in that eight. And I'd be fine. And we're leaving off some fantastic players. There's no question. And, you know, um, if people say, where's Barnett? Well, he, played, he was here six years. You know, uh, that's, that's my cop out on that one. Uh, but he, Garnett was fantastic. And, and, but he's just, it's, it's, a, it's a nice legacy, though, isn't it? It's a very pleasant problem. I'll, Yes. Women in sports. Yes. And sports writing. You, up, you obviously, when you talked about Boston and, and how blessed we are, but in our DNA. So, as you heard from the first caller, I mean, first in terms of Barbara yeah. asking questions, we really do have it. Where is the opportunity for uh, women in sports writing? Um, you know, my daughter, when she was six years old, watched the top 10 with her dad. And so she knows, probably mm -hmm. even to this day. Again, you know, is there a differentiation because women aren't playing football or basketball? What's your advice? It, first of all, it, it's come a long way. Uh, when I started, it was extremely rare to have a woman involved in any capacity. And as a matter of fact, in press boxes, um, both basketball, baseball and football, women were officially barred. Baseball, the BBWAA, they were barred. Football, press box, they were barred. And um, uh, th during the 70s, uh, women began to get uh, uh, more opportunities. And, and the NBA, there was a period of time in the late 70s and early 80s when there were like five or six different uh, primary beat writers in the NBA were women. And I don't think there's that many now. I don't know what happened to them all. A couple things happened to women. Number one is men are allowed, this, does this sound familiar, by the way, ladies, in terms of entertainment? Men are allowed to age gracefully. Women aren't. Uh, you know, men, men can go, I, mean, I went from 23 to retiring at 66, uh, going into locker rooms and never feeling totally uncomfortable. But obviously it changes you know, demographically and all. But uh, there's no 60-year-old women covering anything. And, and, uh, and, but, and, and that they don't, they're not allowed, somehow, that, so that, your, your shelf life is automatically uh, reduced uh, until society changes in some other way. Um, but 
it, you, there are lots of women sports writers and very good. We have just added to the Boston Globe staff. Has anybody been following the byline Tara Sullivan since she came? I, uh, and with all due respect to my, you know, colleagues uh, I left behind five, four years ago, five years ago, uh, she's she's automatically become the best writer on the staff. She's the best pure writer on the staff. And she's, I just think what she just did in the Olympics, and I found out it was the first time she'd ever been to the Olympics. I mean, she's a fantastic addition. There's some, there, and she's, you know, not alone out there, but she's, she's the best writer on the staff already. John Powers used to be the best writer on the staff, but he retired. Now Tara's got the honor. There's tremendous women out there, but, but women's careers are, are arc differently. I have one friend that's, God knows she's uh, still hanging in there in, in, uh, uh, in uh, Sacramento, and she's a, 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 a uh, exception to the rule. She may be having the longest career now of any woman uh, in terms of covering things that I know of, uh, and, I, I, uh, and she doesn't seem to have any uh, indication of slowing down. But um, I, I, we're just speaking to talking about writing. Uh, Broadcasting is even worse, I mean, in terms of, you know, women on television, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're, it, it, it's... Um, same as it is in any other walk of life, the uh, you know the looks matter and the hair matters and the, and, and 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 it's just in a way that it just doesn't for a male and it's not right, but it's it's, it's a microcosm of you know the society there. Yes. Thank you for coming. Uh, my question is it relates to uh, basketball. As a basketball fan or just in general, what are your thoughts on as far as the particularly in the NBA the whole move to quote unquote small ball? Hmm. Um, with, with you know, with up, running up and down, with less um, emphasis on uh, half court offense, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. combination of the big man. Yeah. Do you think that that's uh, permanent, sustainable, or just what are your thoughts? Well, I hope it's not permanent, and it, it, it's the trend, and it's still trending in that direction. Um, I, 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 it's going to take. Well, I, no, it's a great question because it's something that troubles me. I don't enjoy the game as much the way it is as I did before because there's no balance. I don't have any, there's no, nothing wrong with shooting the three as part of the deal, but when the three becomes the overwhelming part of the deal and, the, and, and, and everything revolves around the three and to the exclusion of, of post play, we were sitting here talking earlier uh, uh, about Kevin McHale. And, you know, there's been nothing like him since he retired. You know, there's, there's no great, there are very few great post players. Everybody, all the big men are, are instructed to shoot threes now themselves. Look at whoever thought 30 years ago that there'd be a seven foot three inch guy from who, who had no post moves, to, but was averaging 20 points a game shooting jump shots uh, as his Porzingis. All right, I, I'll go back in 2012, the year he was in college. Carl Anthony Towns, when Kentucky won, uh, no, the year that was the year after when, when Kentucky, when he was at Kentucky, he was 14, I guess. I saw this kid and said, oh boy, this is the kid that's going to change everything. He's old-fashioned, low-post ass kicker, right, you know? <laughs> and before he left Kentucky, he said, I can't wait till I get to the NBA so I can shoot the threes Coach Cow won't let me shoot. <laughs> and he's doing it and making them, I hate to tell you, you know, as is Joe Embiid. Guys have reinvented themselves too, Mark, Mark Gasol. Best example, Brooks Lopez, Brook Lopez. First seven years in the league took like ten threes total, you know. Now you know they were at the end of the clock, you know, with desperation. And then a couple of years ago, he uh, started taking a few more. Last year, he took more threes than anybody on the, on the nets at seven feet. And now he's out in LA doing the same thing. And uh, he said, "That's the league. That's the way the world is." No, I don't enjoy it as much. And, and when a team takes more threes than twos in a game, as Houston did not too long ago, and which happens in college more than you think, uh, no, that's not the game I enjoy. But uh, it, 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 it's the formula, and uh, it, I, 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 some coach is going to have, now, it's interesting now, the Celtics, they got Greg Monroe, and if you read both papers today about Monroe, who had a pretty good game last night, his first best game since he's come, and he's, <coughs> they want to find a way to balance it off and integrate and, and, and exploit matchups, and this guy's a good low post player, and so they don't want to waste him by not having him do what he does best. Uh, and I'm, I, that was music to my ears, you know, they're going to try to find a way to exploit Greg Monroe in a low post. So maybe Brad Stevens is going to be the guy to help us find that balance. But I'm, I, I think you and I are on the same page with this. Especially, you know, I even though I said that uh, like, you know, at the AU level, that's also preaching emphasis. Oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's 10 year old kids hoisting threes drives me crazy. And AAU, oh yeah, no question. The, the whole game, the mid range, uh, oh, it's given birth to the, the most odious phrase in sport right now to me is the one that says this, the worst shot in basketball is the long two. And, and in some people's eyes, any two that's not a layup. Forget about long two, but 15 foot. <laughs> and I hate that, you know. I mean, so I, I but you know, in life, and sports and uh, politics and you know, the pendulum swing. 
they swing and they come back and they swing and, and, and I'm hoping that this pendulum swing will start going back the other way in, in, in due time, but it, it's, it's not in good, we're not you know, in a good shape in that regard right now. Yes? I'm a big fan, so thanks for coming and talking. You're welcome. Well, comments because it's not, it's predictable now. So I know LeBron's going to get the ball and he's able to run through somebody and, and dunk it. And, he and you know that he's complaining very bitterly that he's not getting the line enough. He's a, I know he's, he is. He's, he's, uh, he's incredulous. This is his six. Uh, <clears throat> truth somewhere in the middle. First of all, it didn't start with LeBron. Uh, it started at least with Dr. J. That's when I, and, and it may have started with Elgin Baylor, my all time boyhood idol may have started with him. But uh, they said the same thing at times about Dr. J. They surely said the same thing at times about Jordan. And now it's LeBron's turn as, the, as that guy. Um, yes, traveling is a, a, a very, uh, and now we have a, th a new phenomenon in basketball, uh, which came into being, the phrase came in as a joke to, to, to denounce something. It has now been incorporated in as a given that you accept it. The Euro step, okay? That's traveling by all, things that we've ever known. It's that one extra little, and it started out, you were making fun of it, and now it's, it's okay. Everybody kids about it, because it's been incorporated. The refereeing world is incorporated in their eyes. It's okay to take the Euro step, which is an extra step. No question. Um, yeah, it would be a better game if they could govern, if they would govern that. Uh, but, 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 Lon, but, you're, but this show, LeBron's on both ends of this argument here. You know, I think he's right. He should get the line somewhat more. How much, maybe not as much as he thinks, but uh, he does go to the line, uh, go to the basket a lot. And, but he also, he's powerful. He, he commits some offensive fouls, there's no question. Uh, no question about that. Um, but that's an interesting, it's an interesting point. But um, um, I say, yeah, if, if it, you just have to, I mean, there's a lot of things we have to come ac make accommodations with. I mean, I've had to make an accommodation with this whole three-point thing. Uh, so not, I don't want it to spoil my interest in the game entirely. It, 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 it makes me angry, but I still like the game enough that I still watch it. But I wish, it, I, wish I could fix it. Along the same lines, how about, I mean, every time I see somebody dribble now, when I grow up. Oh, this, like the palming? Palming. Oh, the, that's, that's not, to me, that's, a more, that's much more... Prevalent, right? It used to be when we were all taught how to play basketball. And I'm sure we got youth basketball coaches here somewhere, right? Yeah, you know, this is how you dribble a basketball. And then Allen Iverson came into this earth, and he started walking up the court like this. And I, and you know, every, now that's. Right. I'm blaming him for a lot of things, by the way. <laughs> but I mean, by the way, he was amazing. He toughest inch pound for I, I subscribe to that theory. Toughest inch for inch, pound for pound player ever. This guy was, was Iverson. I'll give him that. But yes, palming. And, and every once in a while they get, they'll call it a dribbling violation. You know, I wish we would call it for what it is. It's palming. <laughs> but you know, yes, yes. And way back, and I'll go. Yeah. Yes. The most fun college team I've seen in the last few years is the UConn women. Oh yeah. It's the best team basketball I've seen. Well, the UConn women are so. Uh, they just uh, just wrapped up their tenth regular season, undefeated season. And, um, you know, what Gino's done, you know, there's no reason for it to happen. There, there, there were, nothing was going on out of the ordinary at UConn until he came along, and, and he's created this incredible dynasty. I can't imagine playing for them and being the pressure of being, you, we want to be this team that, you know, messes up the run. They got beat last year at the buzzer, you know, at the buzzer by Mississippi State. Uh, you don't think they want to play them again this year? Oh, boy. And who's number two this year? Mississippi State. So they're on a collision course, perhaps, for, the, for uh, a rematch of that championship game. Oh, what, what Gino has done. First of all, I said this about Calhoun, too, in terms of uh, making UConn, you know, a power. Um, I said uh, they should put on their Hall of Fame plaques. should say, he made U Stores Connecticut a destination. Because there is no Stores Connecticut. It basically is, it's, Mad, it's um, um, uh, Madison, no, not Madison, uh, I got the, it's a, but it's, it's, it's a strip mall, you know, with a post office. It's stores itself, it's, it's, they are stores, the campus is stores. And it's, it's, 
it's amazing what he's done, yes. Uh, and they're good. And this year's team is yet another one. And I'm sure he's recruited yet, for yet another one. I don't know. It's going to end when he retires. That's when. That's when it's going to end. Not, not until. Uh, the gentleman in front, yes. You mentioned Baylor a few minutes ago. What's your perspective on Baylor and West and their, and their place in basketball? Well, all right, I'll start with Baylor. I believe, and I may, I may be out there, uh, that uh, Elgin Baylor is the single most important individual in, the, in determining the way individual basketball has been played in the last 60 years. I think there was basketball before Elgin and after Elgin in terms of individual offensive play. He brought things to the game we had never seen. Um, he took a game that was essentially horizontal and a little bit vertical, and he made it what I call diagonal. He comes in with all the stutter step moves, all these uh, uh, shot release points, the up and unders, the head fakes and stuff, and, and that was not done before Elgin Baylor. And as far as Jerry West is concerned, it just uh, one of the handful of greatest sh uh, shooters and toughest competitors, two-way guards. Really, he and Oscar Robertson were the standard until you know they were they were the all-time backcourt, and then we got Magic and Michael, and you can argue that forever. Uh, but still, Jerry West deserves, deserves being in any top 10 or 12 discussion of all-time players, and and uh, as a competitor, uh, is second to none. But Elgin is the one I worry about. That his legacy is not now. There's a biography by a guy named Bijan B A I J A N Bain B A Y N E. I was privileged to write the foreword for that, and uh, about Elgin. So I'm, I got myself, uh, you know, recorded for posterity on the subject of Elgin. But uh, uh, I am very proprietary toward Elgin Baylor, and he was my two boyhood idols. Uh, originally, were Elgin Baylor and Ted Klazuski. Big clue. So, first, don't ask me why. I was the first baseman, I guess. Right? So, first at Little League. Gentlemen, uh, yes, sir, you? No? Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask about from the NFL part of it is uh, what do you think about the Bill Belichick as a trophy to be named after Bill Belichick? What would it take? Well, you know, he is the best coach in, 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 in I mean, most successful coach in NHL history, NHL, NFL history. Um, I just wish it were accompanied by a more buoyant personality, you know. <laughs> uh, I, I wish he could be an even better ambassador. He, you know, he, look, we all strive for whatever, and among, but what we strive for ultimately, uh, I think, among other things, is to be comfortable in our own skin, right, and hope we are. He is. Unfortunately, he's totally comfortable in his own skin, the way he is, doing it the way he's done it. He could bring so much more and be so much a better ambassador. I will... I'll just try and do my little uh, Cliff Notes version of Belichick because he's a fascinating topic, okay? I think that there's not much doubt in my mind that uh, no person has ever coached in this league who knew more about football, the ins and outs of it. I know I know, know more about history. You can't love football more than he does. And he was another prodigy. He was a Mozart. You know, his father was the assistant at Navy all those years, 33 years. Uh, everyone in the NFL knew him because he ran camps and he was a scout. And they knew he had this little protege kid named Billy that he had in the film room when he was 10 or 12. Anyway. He has a sense of history. I say he knows more about Paul Brown than Mike Brown does. I mean, he knows more about football. And he likes to share it with you. And everybody sees this image of him that he should never even come out after the game. You know, don't present yourself on Sunday or Monday night or Thursday night. Let somebody else come. By, because he's useless. You know, it's the same thing. We were, we, were, we were either A, we were very good in all three phases of the game, or B, we were not very good in all three phases of the game. And then that's about as far as he wants to go. And maybe he'll say something nice about Tom. And that's about it. Now. Um, Monday, he's better. He's seen the tape. He's, you know, he's digested the loss, and, and he gets better. At the, and by Friday, remember, he has to face the press every day. By Friday, he's like a raconteur. Friday's a nice, calm day. It's a walk-through day. The game plan's in. Uh, and if you just push the right button about football, don't ask him about the injury list. You know, don't, don't ask him about the day-to-day -day meat and potatoes of the team, but you want to talk about football. I don't care if you want to talk about long he, One day he did like 10 minutes on long snappers last year, you know. And, and he's, he's an encyclopedia, and he loves it and wants to share it with you, you know. But he won't show the – but only this few writers get to see it. But in public, you know, he said – every once in a while, you know, he has been on, you know, Tonight Show, you know, and, and that, you, you, a couple of times after they've won, and, and he's smiling. And, and I, I – it's just the way he chooses to present himself. It's too bad. He could really – knowing as much as he knows and, and caring as much as he cares about football, he could be a better ambassador of the game. I think that's a, rather a, a, a given. Yes? Uh, as a fan, your uh, most painful loss and sweetest victory. Uh, mm, boy, as a fan. Uh, oh, oh, uh, there was some, this would, this would be, uh, you know, go back to uh, uh, BC as a fan. 
and in 1969, uh, I was a, a year after I graduated, but I got out, of, I was in the Army Reserves. I come back in February, and the Globe rehires me as an office boy, and BC gets, is on a run. Cousy announces retirement. They won 19 games in a row, and it took them all the way to the finals of the NIT. And the NIT still meant something a great deal then. It was, it was still only 16 teams. It was still important to win the NIT, and it would have been a great thing. And BC wins. First game, they beat Kansas. Second game, they beat Army, which was with Knight, a very good team. Third team, they beat Louisville and vice versa. And the fourth round championship game was against Temple. And we're up, and I say we, and I was covering this game, by the way, for the Globe. But we're up by nine with nine minutes to go, and we got outscored 27 to nine the rest of the way and got beat. And, and uh, I, I, if we pay Temple, one of those deals, I think if we played them 10 times, we'd beat them eight or 10, eight or nine. But this was one of the nine, one or two. That hurt. I really hurt. Uh, I, cared, I cared, you know, I, was, I still was very young and cared very deeply and, and knew the guys and, and, and everything. It was, um, it, it was that, 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 I keep replaying that game in my head, you know. Uh, you know. When the games go to last shot, you know, that's, you know, that's dicey. That can, it can happen. But this is a game that BBC was in co complete control. We're going to win the, win the NIT. And, of course, to this day, they've, you know, never won it. And they've uh, never gotten to the Final Four. They've gotten to the Final Eight three times. A couple of those were close, um, but... But no, uh, and, and just talking in terms of the, the local uh, professional sports teams, uh, I did mention 2010 with the Celtics. Uh, that one bothered me uh, a lot. Um, they were up by three, but uh, three minutes to go, three or four minutes to go, and in 94 seconds, they went from plus three to minus six, and the game was over. And, and they, caught, they turned it over, but it all started the way so many Laker victories in those, that era started. Derek Fisher hits a three. That he, if they don't put a little, maybe, maybe not a statuette, but a bust for him out there, you know, because of his contribution, it wasn't the only time he ever hit a big three for them. Derek Fisher hits a three and gets them back in it, and we, and we get beat. Beats, uh, the Celtics were better. They were better than the Lakers that year, and, and they should have won that series. That, that one hurts a lot. Uh, and uh, satisfaction-wise, uh, because it was my team, you know, and I was young, and I had seen the whole thing grow from the beginning. Uh, I mentioned how Cowens came in 2010, uh, excuse me, in 1970. When the Celtics won in 74, it's the first championship game team I covered personally. And I, I was very deeply embedded with that team. I was very uh, friendly with a lot of people. It was very emotional, and it was a great series. And I, that meant a lot to me, be able to sit my first time to write a story about the team winning the championship. You know, it's first of like 17 of them I've had, thank God, being in Boston, literally. But that was, uh, that was the first time. Uh, so uh, I really enjoyed that. And I, I really enjoyed, I'll tell you what really meant a lot to me. You know, I, I'm like I had nothing to do with it. Like I was talking earlier about how we're all lucky to be in Boston with these teams. Well, I was lucky to be a writer around these teams. But when the Bruins won in 11, you know, that, was, that meant I could say I covered all four championships, literally covered championships in all four sports. Not many people get to do that, and, and, I, and I'm not a hockey guy, but that team was fun and special, and I, I was privileged to be there when they beat uh, Tampa Bay, one nothing, game seven, somebody, no penalties. And Guy Boucher, the coach of the Lightning, said that was like 60 minutes of overtime, it was. And then go out in Vancouver, be down 0-2, come back and win that game 4 nothing in the finals and uh, be on the ice with them I was, after the game. That was, that was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that. I mean, I had so many moments. And, uh, of course, I could do the rest of the day on Bird alone. You, <laughs> seriously, you can imagine that. So I've been, and the Patriots, of course. The tuck rule game was I'll always living in memory that night. It was a fumble. But, uh, you know, hey. Gruden will never get over it. By the way, speaking of never getting over it, he, his last words, I promise you, will be, it was a fumble. But I'm happy he's back in the I like having him back in the game. All right, I think we've reached. Okay. So I apologize that we ran way over, but I got to tell you, this is probably one of our best, best pr presentations ever. I'm going to stick around. I'm going to ask Bob to stick around because I know other people have some sure. questions. For you non-sports <laughs> fans, uh, I will have movie theater tickets for you guys <laughs> next week. But for anyone else that wants to stick around, I'm sure Bob would love to stick sure. around. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Great day today. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>